I'm Sonia Michelle, and I'm Director of U.S. Studies uh, here at the Wilson Center, and I've been partnering with Christian Osterman and his staff in history and the History and Public Policy Program, and we together are partnering with the National History Center um, on this series, and it's been very, very exciting uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, for, for before it started, Christian and I would wander around the hall saying, where are the historians? Why don't we ever have anybody talking about history? So this is a way for us to bring historians to the center and uh, but within this broader rubric of history and public policy questions, um, and today's speaker fits very well into that rubric, um, David Bell is going to be speaking about the French and American revolutions in modern democracy, so he's going to be giving us a historical perspective on, of course, one of the major issues of our, our, our time and, and every, any time, many times. Um, David Bell is a professor of history at Princeton University, and he's considered one of the nation's top experts in the history of France. He focuses in particular on the French Revolution, on early modern France, and on the relationship between, the early, between early modern Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, Professor Bell earned his PhD in history from Princeton in 1991, and he has since taught at Yale and at Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, where he also served as dean of faculty <coughs> before returning to teach at Princeton. David Bell is the author of three books on various aspects of French history, including Lawyers and Citizens, The Cult of the Nation in France, and most recently, The First Total War, which examines how, French po how political culture in Europe changed between 1750 and 1815 to make total war possible. His current major project is a dual biography of the French revolutionaries Armand-Louis Gontaut and Charles-Philippe Gontran, Ronsin, which he hopes will illuminate the relationship between politics, literature, and war in the age of revolutions. In addition to his research and teaching, David Bell writes frequently for a range of general interest publications, particularly the New Republic, where he's a contributing editor. He's committed to the proposition that serious history can be readable, enjoyable, and accessible to an interested general public. And I'm sure we're gonna see that in today's talk. <clears throat> so again, the title is The French and American Revolutions and Modern Democracies. Please welcome David Bell. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, the National History Center for inviting me, particularly Roger Lewis, um, also to Anita and to Sonia, particularly to Sonia for that overly generous introduction. Um, just a quick word on how this, you know, the sort of the history of this paper, so to speak. Um, <coughs> it's actually kind of a double National History Center project because the National History Center is also doing a series of books on <coughs> sort of reinterpretations of, of major events, how major events have been in history have been interpreted. One of these is going to focus on the French Revolution, and we had a preview of it at the uh, American Historical Association this winter, and the editor, Carla Hesse, asked me to speak about the French Revolution and democracy in 20 minutes, <laughs> um, from, from the time of the revolution to the present. So I thought, well, if I'm going to do something that, 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 that silly or audacious, to have take your pick, I might as well double down and actually bring the American Revolution in as well. So I tried to offer some, some very um, schematic thoughts about the two revolutions and modern democracy, and Roger Lewis was there and then invited me to do it again here. Um, so I'm very happy to be able to do this. I've expanded it a bit, but it's still probably, you know, we'll be on the short side for these seminars, and I hope uh, that there'll be enough uh, that will <coughs> come up that will prompt questions that we can just go into an extended uh, qu question and answer session. Um, so to start, I wanted to draw your attention to a, a paradoxical difference that I see, at least, between France and America. Now, it, it's well known that in terms of classic, the sort of classic categories of political science, the United States is more of a, of a republic than a democracy. That's to say it's a classic mixed regime whose constitution balances elements of democracy, aristocracy, and monarchy, and was very you know, consciously conceived of this at the start. France, on the other hand, at least in the non-monarchical phases of its modern history, has been more of a democracy, which is to say that the popular will expressed in legislative assemblies has had decisively more power than the executive, the judiciary, or any sort of elite senate. And I think this point holds even for today's quasi-monarchical Fifth Republic. Um, first of all, although finally France has something like a Supreme Court in the form of the Cour Constitutionnelle, it is still considerably weaker than the American Supreme Court. As for the presidency of the Fifth Republic, I think it's very, it's, it's still very significant, 
that when <coughs> a party opposed to the president gains a parliamentary majority, the president in fact cedes much, much of the political initiative to the prime minister making for periods of what the French call cohabitation. So the, I think the comparison seems fairly clear to this extent between France and the United States. But here's the paradox. In contemporary America, the word republic has a distinctly archaic sound. There's relatively little political salience, even for the Republican Party. Politicians, on the other hand, incessantly trumpet the glories of American democracy. Meanwhile, in France, the words démocratie, démocratique are certainly not without resonance. There's even a new party called the Mouvement Démocratique, although it's not very successful, which maybe goes a certain extent towards proving my point. Uh, because in general, invocations of democracy in current French political culture are much less frequent than in, uh, in the United States. They pale, certainly, in comparison to invocations of the republic, la république, républicain, in political discourse. I think if we were to talk about the way historians look at it, I think very significantly, one of the great recent collections of historical work published in France, this is Pierre Morat's great collection, Realms of Memory, Lieu de Mémoire. It has an entire volume on the republic. It has not even a single entry on democracy. François Furé, who was one of the greatest interpreters of the French Revolution of the past century, was less concerned about democracy itself than about the way it could degenerate pathologically into totalitarianism. And Furé himself was a great upholder of the Republican tradition. Most of his followers would define themselves in politics first and foremost as Republicans, small r. So how do we explain this paradox? Why is it then that Americans think of themselves as the great example of democracy, but li live in a Republican political system that has actually done a fairly good job of limiting and even paralyzing the direct expression of the popular will? Well, on the other hand, the French have a form of government which, at least in theory, gives far more scope to the direct expression of the popular will. But they think of themselves principally as a republic. Now, on the American side, and I'm ready to be corrected here, I think things seem relatively straightforward. Since the early 19th century, American political figures have made democracy a rallying cry precisely to challenge the less democratic aspects of our Constitution, our politics, and our society. In the late 18th century, the Founding Fathers still generally disparaged what they called democracy. And by this, of course, they meant direct democracy, direct rule by all the people assembled as in ancient Greece. John Adams said the word, and I'm quoting, signifies a nation of people without any government at all. James Madison carefully distinguished democracies from republics. But by the first decade of the 1800s, the concept had been redefined more broadly and was rapidly gaining favor. And the modern Democratic Party, of course, traces its origins precisely back to this period in American history. But what about France? Why is it that since the French Revolution, the ideal of democracy has been, I think, in some very crucial ways, subordinate to the ideal of the republic? Now, the French historian Maurice Agulon famously argued many years ago that the importance of the republic as a symbol, in fact, derives largely from the long and weary struggle to establish and maintain this form of government against ferocious opposition. And just to review, of course, as you know, France has had not just one republic, but five, the first republic founded in 1792 that staggered along for a grand total of seven years before falling victim to Napoleon, the Second Republic in 1848, managing to stay alive for only four, most of those as a barely breathing corpse, before Napoleon's nephew abolished it, the Third Republic lasting 70 years, still setting the record from 1870 to 1940, the Fourth Republic going back to form and collapsing in just 16 in the Algerian War, or 14, excuse me, and we have yet to see if the Fifth Republic is really going to survive Nicolas Sarkozy or not. So the French Republic has always been, I think, something of an endangered species compared to the American one, despite our, our civil war. But this story does not explain the tension between the concepts of republic and democracy in France, or the implications of this tension for the actual practice of democracy in France. So what I'd like to do in the rest of this lecture is to propose a three-part reflection on this puzzle, <coughs> focusing on the French case. And in each part, but in each case, I will come in each part, I will come back to the French-American comparison and particularly invoke three critical transformations that took place in the early history of the United States that had little or no equivalent in France. So, uh, 
The first part of this reflection is one that students of the French Revolution, I think, will find familiar, as recent scholarship on the revolution is particularly emphasized. In 1789, the leading revolutionaries, like their American contemporaries, had a strong distaste for what they called democracy, which they too still defined as direct democracy, and saw as something entirely distinct from popular sovereignty. In the words of Emmanuel C.S., who had reflected on this point at length in his manuscripts and was one of the founding fathers of the French Revolution, he wrote quite simply, France is not and cannot ever be a democracy. The revolutionary lawyer Guy Target quickly squirmed away from any suggestion in one of his very popular pre-revolutionary pamphlets that he could be a democrat. He exclaimed, democracy in a nation of 25 million? I do not see how such a thing could ever be and I'm insulted by the very idea. <coughs> Even early in the revolution, one of the prominent early leaders of the revolutionary movement, Antoine Barnave, went so far as to call democracy the greatest of plagues a polity could possibly experience. Now it's true that under the reign of terror of 1793 to 94, democracy was redefined more broadly in France. Favorable uh, invocations of it became more frequent. Maximilien Robespierre, the dominant figure of the terror, insisted that republican government and democratic government were in fact synonymous. This is a point that the great uh, American historian R.R. Palmer made many years ago in his attempt to cast the French Revolution as one of a series of democratic revolutions, which he saw as essentially egalitarian and anti-aristocratic when he tried to in fact show the American and French revolutions in very much the same light. But I think it's worth pointing out that after the end of the terror, and this is something Palmer didn't really acknowledge, the use of the term democracy very quickly waned again. The architects of the directory, which was the last government under the Republic before Napoleon, preferred by far to invoke the Republic, its laws and its institutions, its name, rather than speaking of democracy, which was in fact tarnished by its association with the Robespierre and the terror. And one of the few people willing to stand up for the idea of democracy under the directory, this is the proto-communist Gracchus Babeuf, recognized this fact when he wrote the following to an opponent. I'm quoting, you can gather around you none but Republicans, but that's a banal and equivocal title. We gather together all the Democrats and plebeians. So already for Babeuf, he was already recognizing the extent to which the, the regime had already turned away from the, from the idea and practice of democracy as it was understood at the time. Now, of course, recent historians in France point out that the word republic itself has had many contested meanings. The historian Pierre Cernat in particular, though, has made the argument that after 1794, the men in power increasingly defined it as a regime of laws, of powerful state institutions, and of limited suffrage, dominated by a small wealthy elite, rather than as anything broadly popular or participatory. And Cernat argues that the long quest in France to find a stable path between ultra-revolution on the one hand and counter-revolution on the other hand ultimately led French elites in the 1790s to what he calls, and it's a very nice phrase, the Republic of the Extreme Center. It also led them to a reinforcement of executive power um, with Napoleon, and in his words, a stifling of democratic debate. Cernat mostly limits his reflections to, to the late 18th century, but he does speculate that what he calls this worrisome spectacle has repeated it ever since, with the elites again and again, with French elites again and again embracing the supremacy of Republican laws and institutions precisely to hold in check the unruly forces of popular democracy. And filling in a bit what Selna has proposed, we could see this happening in 1848 to 51, when Louis Napoleon crushed the opponents who significantly called themselves the Democ Soc, the Democratic Socialists. It happened in 1870-71, when the Versailles Republic, the Conservative Republic, crushed the radical Paris Commune. And you could say that it continues right down to the often conservative neo-Republicans, the phrase that they themselves like to use, in contemporary France, who are very, very much want to reinforce executive power, restrain the role of popular, popular democracy, popular protest. So in, sort, so in short, Cernat sees a French pattern that's di diametrically opposed to the one that I sketched out for the American case. In the United States, the idea of democracy and associated practices such as universal manhood suffrage, the referendum, gained ground as influential forces challenged hierarchical and inegalitarian aspects of our constitution, our politics, and our society. 
In France, by contrast, in much the same period, centrist elites rallied to the idea of an impersonal tutelary republic that was above politics so that they could restrain what they saw as popular excesses from the sans-culottes of the French Revolution to the Demoxoc of 1848 to the Commune of 1870 and perhaps all the way down, all the way down to May 1968 and to the present. And I think there's a lot that's compelling about this argument. In fact, while I doubt Cernat would agree because he's not a great fan of Tocqueville, I think that what he's arguing actually jibes very well with Tocqueville's observations in Democracy in America about what he called soft despotism and the tendency of modern states to become tutelary powers, in his words, that work for the happiness of their citizens, but strip them of all real voice and initiative. And in France, I would argue, it's exactly Cernat's extreme center that has sometimes tried to make the republic itself into such a tutelary power. But I also think this is only one part of a larger story. And again, the comparison with the United States, I think, will help bring out what I mean. So I've already mentioned one critical transformation that the United States experienced in the early years of the 19th century, which is the increasingly broad embrace of the concept of democracy. Let me now turn to a second. So this is the second part of, of my reflections here. And this is the emergence of a party system. Now, in the 1790s, as Gordon Wood has put it, it was still the case, and I'm quoting, that neither party in American politics accepted the legitimacy or even the existence of the other. But by the end of the next decade, most of Jefferson's Democratic Republicans had made their peace with the word party. And within another 20 years or so, a stable competition between parties had become an unexceptional, if not always applauded, fact of American political life. In France, by contrast, nothing of the sort occurred. While the American Democratic Republican clubs of, 17, of the 1790s eventually evolved into the nucleus of the modern Democratic Party, their closest French equivalent, which is to say the Jacobin clubs of the French Revolution, were outlawed at the end of the Reign of Terror. During the last five years of the First Republic, factional disputes led to three coup d'etats in less than two years, and then with Napoleon's fourth and final coup of the 18th of Brumaire, party political life in France ceased entirely. But even when it emerged again under the Restoration in 1815, parties still did not accept the label of party, still refused for the most part to accept the legitimacy of their opponents. And I would argue to venture a very large uh, generalization that compared to the United States, party politics, but also compared to many of its European neighbors, party politics in France has remained remarkably fragile and unstable ever since. The Third and Fourth Republics were notorious for the unstable whirl of parties that were constantly splitting and merging. The Fifth Republic has done better, but I'd argue that its parties still don't have anything like the stability of party systems in Great Britain, Germany, the Scandinavian countries, or the United States. And I will point out to say here that when I gave this paper at the American Historical Association, Lynn Hunt, who was the commentator, disputed this um, and, was and was talking about how much stability the French party system had gained. I'm very glad to say that Dominique de Villepin, Chirac's former foreign minister, just created a new conservative party. Um, which, is, uh, which I think at least goes some way towards supporting my point. There's also the Mouvement Démocratique of François Bayrou, which was created just three years ago, which already seems on the way out. Um, um, whereas in Britain, now we see the resurgence of the liberals. Who would have thought it? Um, <coughs> but we can certainly talk about that point more. One of the, th one of the things, though, I think about even the Fifth Republic in France, which is, which is, which is interesting, is if you look even at, at the Gaullist party, the party founded by Charles de Gaulle after the liberation. It's, it's interesting to note that in 65 years, it has had no fewer than 10 different names down to the present Union for a Popular Movement. I confess I have no idea at all what that means. I think it was because they had the Union for the Presidential Majority and they were too cheap to change the acronym. Um, it claims to transcend party politics, but it's really had little p ideological substance beyond anti-communism under de Gaulle and has mostly functioned as the personal vehicle for its leaders, for de Gaulle, particularly for de Gaulle, for Chirac, and for now for Sarkozy. Um, so we will see. As for the socialists, it's worth remembering that in France for long decades, they refused even to call themselves a party. They preferred to call themselves simply the French section of the Workers' International because they did not see the word party as legitimate. And last year, they very nearly committed mitosis, although I think they were brought back from the edge finally and are still together. So. Um, and these parties have, of course, been surrounded by an ever-shifting nimbus of smaller ones, including single-issue parties like the party of hunters and fishers, three or four tr Trotskyite groups, depending on the time of the month, which occasionally do surprisingly well. And we saw what this all led to in 2002 when the small party was actually deprived 
the socialists of getting into the second round in the French presidential election, allowing Jean-Marie Le Pen to be one of the two finalists. Anyway, I, so I would still stand by the point that I don't think any major Western democracy has really had such a consistently weak party system, and certainly not in any case compared to ours. And I would argue that this fact, too, is related to the tensions between republic and democracy in French political culture that I've been trying to evoke today. At moments when factional strife has threatened to turn violent in France, since particularly since 1870, it is the republic that has served as a useful, purp a useful purpose as the great symbol of unity and legitimacy to which everyone can appeal. And at the same time, again, particularly since the late 19th century, the very fact of this prestige enjoyed by the, by the, by the symbol by the, by the republic, reinforced by all the factors I've been discussing, has made it far more difficult for political parties to achieve stability and public respect. Part of this undoubtedly lies with what the political theorist Pierre Rosen Vallon calls France's political culture of generality. And he means, in general, the huge stress put upon social unity in France, the potential threat that is always seen as posed to it by intermediary bodies and associations of any, any sort, and as he likes to remind his readers all through the 19th century, even through much of the Third Republic, laws remained on the book in, books in France which technically banned any independent association, even social clubs, from existing without permission from the government. Parties were allowed but were considered suspect nonetheless. Those laws are now long gone, but since the late 19th century, the Republic itself has been the incarnation of this generality, and in comparison, political parties look petty and self-interested. So, the final point to which I'd like to draw attention involves political representation. Now, of course, the relationship between representation and democracy deeply concerned revolutionaries on both sides of the Atlantic. As I said, both on both sides, they recognized the obvious impossibility of classical direct democracy, Greek city-state democracy, in large territorial states. In France, the anxieties and philosophical dilemmas that were provoked by the idea, by the very idea of representation, by citizens entrusting their political will and leadership to independent representatives has been the subject of a great deal of important work. And just to emphasize again, I mean, it, it's hard to emphasize just how anxious the French were made to feel in th at the time of the revolution by the idea of political representation. R Rousseau wrote in book three of the social contract about Britain, he said, the British think they are free, it's a mistake. They are free for the moment that they walk into the voting booths and as soon as they walk out again, they are again enslaved. It was only at the moment when they're actually acting politically could they be free. Um, so this has been this the study of a great deal of excellent historical work, particularly by the historians Francois Furet, Keith Michael Baker, and Paul Friedland. And Friedland in particular argues that the re radical revolutionaries ended up largely rejecting what he calls modern liberal representation in favor of older religiously inflected concepts by which representatives were held in some way mystically to incarnate the popular will. And what he means is that under the French monarchy, to begin with, the king wasn't simply seen as the agent of the French people, standing in for them and doing their bidding. In a metaphorical sense, he was seen as the French people, somehow embodying them, and that during the Radical Revolution, the National Convention came to have very much the same sort of role and defined itself in very much the same way. But I want to look here at a different aspect of this phenomenon. So let me again invoke the comparison with the United States in the early 19th century. <coughs> and here I want to focus on what I would call a culture of political celebrity. Um, now, the American historian Francois Furstenberg has recently traced in fascinating detail the career of Mason Locke Weems, Parson Weems, who in 1809 published his famous Life of Washington. This book, which remains familiar to us because of the story of George and the Cherry Tree, which we all remember, was one of the most single popular books ever published in the United States up to this point. It took the impressive and imposing commanding figure of General Washington and brought him down to earth, essentially making him the approachable hero of a real-life novel not just famous, but a celebrity. Although aimed primarily at children, the book created a powerful bond of sympathetic identification between Washington and adult readers as well. And in the years that followed, these same techniques were increasingly applied, not only to canonical and safely dead figures like Washington, but increasingly to living political candidates, Andrew Jackson, William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, many others. And it has long since become a completely routine feature of American politics. <coughs> this bond of identification, I think, is very similar to ones that the historian Lynn Hunt has studied, 
in the context of the 18th century. She argues that thanks in part to the powerful new experience of reading novels and the effective bonds that readers learn to forge with characters in novels, such as Richardson's Pamela, many others, men and women in the 18th century found new ways of identifying and sympathizing with people they'd never met and a feeling viscerally that these people deserved what came in the period to be called for the first time human rights. But the similar bonds of sympathetic identification that grew up in the early American Republic between voters and politicians, thanks increasingly to these kind of narratives, novelistic narratives, composed by and for the politicians, have had tremendous importance as well. Now these bonds are often derided, particularly by intellectuals. The cry goes up at every election that we shouldn't choose a candidate based on whom we would like to have a beer with. Um, but I would argue that in these bonds, in fact, represent one way that Americans have reconciled themselves to the practice of political representation and have overcome the very real anxieties that were, as Paul Friedland reminds us, once associated with it. Why should you trust someone you don't know, somebody you've never met, with your political fortunes, with leading your country? However imperfect and artificial, the bonds of identification that are forged by these kinds of narratives still help create a measure of trust between citizens and elected officials. And in this sense, I think they've become an important element of American democracy. But what's remarkable, again, if we go back across the Atlantic and look at France, is how little any compar comparable phenomenon has developed there, either in the revolution or since. During the first republic of the 1790s, the Jacobins tended to regard any parading or novelization of someone's self, of someone's life story, as sheer demagoguery or ambition, which is a word they really didn't like. Being ambitious was a short ticket to the guillotine. Um, <coughs> between 1789 and 94, I think there were only three revolutionaries who had any success in creating stories about themselves, narrat about, narratives about themselves in this way. And each of them had very strong limitations. One was Mirabeau, the great orator of the early revolution, whose career was cut short by his death in 1791. Then there was Jean-Paul Marat, the outrageous radical demagogue who only appealed to a very narrow audience and whose career was also, of course, cut short by his assassination. Finally, Georges Danton, the great orator and opponent of Robespierre, also killed, of although, of course, you know, it's a rather large group that died in the French Revolution here of the leaders. Um, but with Danton, <coughs> the limiting factor is that he was principally a politician of the spoken word. And I should emphasize that the kind of bond of sympathetic identification that I've been talking about is necessarily involves a much larger audience than you can just reach in person. It demands a mass medium that Danton tended to shy away from. It can't just be based on oratory. Meanwhile, Maximilien Robespierre, the dominant figure of the reign of terror, positively abhorred political appeals based on personality preferring a politics of cold, high abstraction. And in fact, in his own life, in his own <coughs> insistence on remaining the neutral vessel of, Republican, of, re of, of re revolutionary energy, of, revo of revolutionary ideas, he himself embodied this concept to an almost absurd degree, trying to blend seamlessly into the, into the concept of revolution itself. Once again, and again to indulge in some very large generalizations, I think that the patterns set in the revolution have to a certain extent prevailed through much of modern French history. Even today, in a France whose public life is increasingly dominated by American-style mass media, the so-called, and again, it's a kind of dirty phrase in, Fra in French, the mediatization of private life remains something remarkably suspect, remarkably criticized. In the past few years, French commentators have come up with a remarkably expressive way to talk about this kind of politics. They call it people politics, using the English word people, a reference maybe to People magazine and the American cult of celebrity. So we have newspaper articles with almost untranslatable franglais titles like, I'll just quote in French, Les politiques stars de la presse people. Um, as a journalist recently wrote very keenly and with some scorn in France, and I will translate this, the lesson of people media is to seduce the public by talking about oneself, of one's inner development. This is considered a very bad thing. And one might add, it do doesn't even really need the, 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 the um, predicate in, in the French sentence, everybody understands it, that this is what American politicians do. Um, and this sort of political appeal is also frequently confounded with populism, populism, another much criticized popular form that is often associated with Nicolas Sarkozy and again with the United States. As soon as any politician seems to be putting his own personality front and center as a reason to vote for him or for her, cries of populism immediately ar arise. <coughs> 
and this is considered illegitimate. And I do think that the fact that Sarkozy in the end has had very little left but the appeal to his own personality here is one reason for his incredible recent collapse in the polls. Um, but here too, I think this characteristic of contemporary French culture, political culture, has much to do with this tension I was talking about between the idea of the republic and the practice of democracy. As Maurice Aguillon nicely put it in his great book, Marianne in Combat, while the American Republic has deified its great presidents and has personified itself in them, on its coins and statues, and right here, I might add, in the Woodrow Wilson, not simply the Woodrow Wilson Center, but the Woodrow Wilson Memorial, um, the French Republic deifies, Aguillon said, nothing but itself. In France, the Republic has in fact acquired such symbolic stature that bonds of sympathetic identification tend to be formed less with mere human politicians than with the Republic, which itself is personified as a female figure, usually named Marianne, and in wonderful French fashion, um, embodied quite literally every few years by a new actress, most famously Catherine Deneuve. Um, this trait has lent French democracy a very different character from American democracy, even today. But there are some notable exceptions to this rule across the course of French history. There are <coughs> some politicians who have either acquired or tried to acquire celebrity status or cults of personality in France. I'd like to just mention four exceptions because I think that these are the exceptions that really do prove the rule. They are Napoleon Bonaparte, Georges Boulanger, Philippe Pétain, and Charles de Gaulle. Each of them, of course, generals. Each of them men who either came to power or strove to come to power by very irregular extra constitutional means, including very much so de Gaulle. And in the case of the first three, entirely undemocratic means, although Boulanger failed in this. Um, these four men did become the object of intense efforts of sympathetic identification by large segments of the French public through precisely the sort of storytelling we associate with American presidential candidates. Even today, the first and the last of them, Bonaparte and de Gaulle, attract the attention of far more biographers than any other political figures in French history. But in each case, the bonds of identification were forged precisely at moments when the Republic was failing, when it had come to seem paralyzed or hopelessly corrupt and unsalvageable except by some, almost some charismatic figure from the outside. <coughs> at the end of the First Republic for, for, for Bonaparte, of course, um, at a crisis for the third, in the case of Boulanger, at the end of the third for Pétain, and at the end of the fourth for de Gaulle, as well as during the crisis of Vichy. Each of the men were seen as saviors who would transcend the Republic or sweep it away entirely, as each of them either wanted to do or did. And in each case, again, they came not from the realm of politics, but from the military, lending them an apparent nobility and glory that allowed them to compete symbolically with Marianne, and they are about the only figures in modern French history who have competed successfully with Marianne for this kind of symbolic stature. I think it's even today significant that even de Gaulle is referred to by his admirers and by his biographers, not as the president, but as le général. Um, so let me offer just a quick word of conclusion here. Um, what I hope that this overly quick and way over general exercise in comparative history has highlighted are the particularly powerful ways in which the idea and the institutions of the Republic have shaped the theory and practice of French democracy since the revolution in comparison to American democracy. In France, the symbolic hegemony of the Republic has made it very difficult for forms of popular political participation or for political parties to achieve full legitimacy, at least in the eyes of French elites. It has made it very difficult for French politicians to forge the sort of bonds with voters that successful American politicians have forged for better or worse. The Republic in personal and eternal towers above them all. The Republic is, of course, the creation of the sovereign people, but it is not the vehicle for the ongoing expression of the popular will. And so we come back to the paradox with which I started. Under each of its five republics, and maybe for more, who knows, France has been, by the terms of classic political theory, an eminently democratic state, but in practice there has been one, above all, one great restraint upon French democratic life during the revolution and since, which has been the Republic itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David.
If Roger were here, he would ask some bold question, but I'm going to open the floor instead because I'm sure there are many questions and comments, starting with Sonia, Don. Sonia, can yeah. we maybe go around the room? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, we forgot to do that. Um, yeah, okay. Let's do that. Sorry. Okay, now, Don, we have, wait, wait, so, um, okay, get to the mic. Thank you for that interesting uh, presentation. When you uh, entitled your, uh, your talk uh, Reflections on the American and French Revolution, I thought you were going to invoke a little of Edmund Burke, um, who uh, supported uh, the American Revolution, and yet, of course, in his reflections uh, on the French Revolution, came out very much against it. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the differing nature of the two revolutions and how that might in part explain how we got to where where we are today. <laughs> in five minutes or less. Um, actually, I'm going to toss that back to you. I mean, would you, is there a particular thing you would like me to think about there? I mean, I'm... If it is, if it is a very big, 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 I mean, I could, uh, we could go on here for, well, for well, all evening. Well, maybe we could I do a, a counterfactual and uh, imagine that uh, George Washington uh, was not as modest as he was and didn't step down after two terms, uh, after not being opposed uh, in those two, and perhaps took on uh, a Napoleonic uh, type of stance as far as guiding the republic. I, I don't, I guess I don't agree with you as much that we are, uh, as much uh, governed by a single person or a cult of personality. I do think what the, the founders devised was a little more ingenious and in that uh, I give Congress a lot more credit, I guess, than some people do. I, I've always enjoyed Arthur Schlesinger's imperial presidency where you know, he said that uh, those of us who are presidentialists uh, probably were wrong all those years in touting the presidency too much and, and giving them too much credit or power or whatever, and that uh, you know, he, he wrote this, of course, after he had left, uh, you know, after Lyndon Johnson stepped down, and uh, we had Richard Nixon. But, uh, you know, I, th I think there's been, you know, rethinking a lot about the the uh, giving so much power to the presidents, and, and nobody denies that they have a lot of power. But I do think that con the Congress still does act as a valuable counterweight. Um, well, I would, I would, I wouldn't disagree with that. I would just suggest that, um, in the broader Western context, the power of the American presidency, while Certainly not, um, certainly not always imperial, or always as dominant as I may have, you know, um, very quickly have, have, have suggested. I thought is still in comparison with with what you see in the he heads of state and the executive branch in in most democracies is, is considerably stronger. Um, and I think to, to that extent, it does harken back to the British Constitution of the 18th century that that, that it was obviously so so heavily influenced by. Uh, when it comes to Washington. Um, and his role, I think that that's, uh, I mean, there's so many counterfactuals that you can play there. I mean, Gordon Wood likes to play these two different counterfactuals with, with Washington. One, the one that you mentioned. The other, if he had not agreed to be president in the first place, uh, would the Constitution possibly have had a chance of being accepted if somebody like Washington hadn't, if, if Washington himself hadn't been willing to step in as the first president, or would we have ended up with uh, something much weaker, uh, closer to? Well, exactly. 
So, um, so I'm, I'm not, uh, <coughs> but um, I think that uh, certainly, you know, if you look at the at the differences between, I mean, I, I see a lot of similarities as, as I tried to indicate in the political cultures of the two revolutions in at the time itself, and then I see a great deal more divergence afterwards. Some of it is already some of it beginning right away. I mean, clearly, in in at, at both times there is a tendency to um, a great hesitancy to accept a kind of legitimate opposition, to accept that somebody can be your opponent, political opponent, and yet still be um, <coughs> and you still be a legitimate member of the polity and to have a legitimate transfer of power. And yet, very quickly, the Americans were able to accept this, and particularly in the election of 1800, they were willing to accept this. And in, of course, in France, they were not. And this becomes one of the great early divergences between between the two revolutions that I think, and again, is one of the reasons why it, it led to so much strife. The French were constantly coming back to this impersonal figure of the Republic. Shall I? Yeah. You can go first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you've done a comparison that's a transatlantic one between America and France. Uh, there are a lot of other countries in the world. And, and if they looked at France, and certainly by the end of the, the 19th century, they wouldn't so much be talking about republic, they'd be talking about the state. Mm -hmm. And that discursively was a word that you didn't really talk about, even though it's a big word in France, and it's a big word in most places outside of the United States, where, where France became a model for various types of bureaucratic centralism, police, etc. cetera. Uh, and I'm just wondering <laughs> what you would, I mean, it's a big question, but if you put the state into the mix, I mean, you mm -hmm. talk about the republic in very abstract terms, but this republic is in many ways synonymous with the state. The state has then this, this relationship Americans will never figure out. It has a relationship with the nation and the democratic polity, as you said, but as you said, it's, it's often a very elitist one. So I just wondered what would happen if you threw the state in. Um, well, I'm going to refuse to be Theo Scott's ball here, and I won't bring the state <laughs> back <laughs> in. <laughs> bring the state um, back in, Ray. But um, I, I would actually argue that the state and the republic are not the same thing in France. Um, that it's very significant that in 1940, when Vichy, when when the Vichy regime was formed, that they abolished the word republic and called themselves the French state. I would say that the f that. The Republic still has a relation, a fundamental relationship to, pop to, to, to the sovereignty of the people. That is what the Republic is the expression of, going back even before the foundation of the French Republic to the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And so what I was trying to draw out were the comparison between two forms of two states, two states, there we go, two countries where the notion of popular, so where of, of popular national sovereignty has always been first and foremost and comparing the different forms taken by that. Um, in, in France, the state has always been there as well, uh, and is certainly throughout all these different regimes. I mean, and of course, quite famously, it, you know, it, it is, it is th the great continuity, particularly in some of these revolutions of the 19th century, when all you needed to really do is to change the thing at the top, and you change the constitution, but you would not change the fundamental institutions of the state, so that people would, you know, the famous joke in the 19th century of where you uh, you go, you go to the, the National Library and you ask for a copy of the Constitution and you're directed to the periodical section. <laughs> but if you wanted to know about the Conseil d'État or then later the Inspection des Finances and, all, and the Intendant, the, uh, not the Intendant, excuse me, the Prefect, of course, then you are uh, going to the state. Um, but again, my focus here was really on these questions of, nationals, of national sovereignty and therefore also on questions of liberty. Um, and which the state is really is really apart from. The state is often seen, now I would say to now to start bringing the state back in, um, the state is often seen here as the enemy of this project, as the enemy of the republic um, by some such as Tocqueville, for instance, who sees the tendency of the state, particularly under the old regime, to devolve into a kind of despotism. And when Tocqueville talks about this kind of tutelary power, he sees this tutelary power being formed through the institutions of the state, uh, therefore crushing, crushing liberty. Um, but ultimately, <coughs> in, in, in France, you did have the success of the form of the Republic. And I think in French eyes, you know, the state is there and the Republic is there and they are two, still two, they, they have a, the, the two sets have a union, but they're still fundamentally distinct. Yes, you, just wait, get wait for the mic. The word Republic is used before 1789 in Britain. Yes. Uh, Baudin in the, in the 1590s wrote six books of the Republic. 
uh, what does it mean? It seems to me the word republic has a more polymorphous connotation possible to it when you admit you ascribe it uniquely to the American Republic and its mixed form. Uh, this is evident, I think, in the duration of the First Republic, which doesn't end in 1799, ends in 1804. And you know, what is it between 1799 and 1804? It's not a monarchy, it's not an empire, it's still a republic in the calendar reflection. Uh, third, third question, I think, third, this is a question. Is the age of the democratic revolution a misnomer? Um, I would, well, I would say yes. I mean, to the to the extent that um, I, 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 it, it 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 bulldozes too many things. Um, it creates the <coughs> the possibility for the rise of democracy, but to and to that extent, I would accept it to say that it that 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 it that these are revolutions. Well, okay. Here, here's how I would make the distinction. Somebody like R.R. Palmer says that these revolutions all have basically the same impetus, that they are all anti-hierarchical, egalitarian revolutions that proceed, that are driven by, if not exactly the rising middle classes, something close to them, um, and are directed against hierarchy. I don't see this as being the fundamental driving force common to all these different revolutions. I think that, that it allows these forces to take shape. It allows, ultimately, these forces, in many cases, to triumph and flourish. But I do not see, as, see it as driving it from the start. And, and to that extent, I would certainly um, draw the line against, against Palmer on that extent. Um, I would say the French Republic effectively ends in 99. I should have said effectively. Um, but, uh, but, 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 uh, but of course, you're, you're right that, that technically it does stagger on until, until the empire in 1804. And even, and even then, the word republic remained in use even under the empire for some time. Because as you say, it is a very polymorphous term. But I'm trying to, I was trying to at least establish a certain set of definitions there that have a particular applica ap applicability to this case. Um, yes. I'm wondering if you could um, talk some about the social basis for some of the differences between the French Revolution and the American Revolution. There have been arguments about sort of the lack of feudalism in yeah. America, the fact that that the high in America w were not as high as in France, and the low um, I is more complicated with I indentured servitude and slavery and all. But nonetheless, a, a much more of a literate population, and yeah. um, that, that there really were some enormous social differences. Those result in differences between the two revolutions, perhaps, and or contribute at least to those differences. Um, absolutely. I mean, what. You know, what I, what's always fascinating, I mean, it, again, it depends partly what period you're talking about, uh, because certainly in France there, there, there is, by the end of the 18th century, a very large group of people who are literate. I mean, even, even going quite far down in the social, social order. I mean, in, in 1789, uh, virtually the entire male population, at least of, you know, male population in Paris that has a permanent residence is literate to some extent. Um, you have a large, you know, you've had a, you have a real consumer revolution going on in French cities in the 18th century. A large group of people who are consuming print media, and who are, in ma you know, and and reading the very similar things to their counterparts in the United States. So, in very much, you know, so very much so, you have sort of comparable groups. Um, in the in the first constitution of the French Revolution, uh, the Constitution of 1791, uh, which only uh, gives the, the vote to quote active citizens, it is these people who. Um, who are very much in some ways the counterparts of the American, of a large part of the American electorate who get the vote. But what then happens is that the French Revolution continues to radicalize. Um, you have the, the sort of the second revolution, if you will, of 1792 and the introduction of, of universal suffrage. And then these leaders of the revolution who come from very much the same sort of social strata as their American counterparts find themselves face to face with a nation of 28 million peasants. And they face the project of, and uh, not to mention the peoples in the, in the cities who are claiming the vote, who are, who are claiming uh, um, polit political influence under the banner of the sans culotte. And then they find themselves faced with the dilemma of how do you integrate these people into the nation? How do you forge, uh, you know, the, the, these very disparate groups into who don't even have a s the same language um, into into a single national polity? Um, and um, 
but I think that to a certain extent, at least you know, in 1789, 1776, you have remarkably similar groups in some ways. So I think that can be over, that can be overstated uh, when you're looking at the early revolution. Yes, um, Tim, and yes, and then Peter. Uh, David, I didn't understand the connection between your argument about republic and democracy and the weakness of the party system and the reluctance of the French parties to accept uh, the, the legitimacy of their opponents. Uh, when I think about that, I think about the overlap between left and right and religion and, s and secularism in the French Revolution and mm -hmm. the depth of the hatreds that the revolution left in its wake after the Vendée and other things like that. I think that's a fairly conventional argument uh, uh, that one hears about why French politics has been so divisive and unstable. You seem to be suggesting something else. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, I think that, I mean, what, what if it were exactly the way that you're describing it, which is often the way it's described, then one would assume that we would have an extremely stable party system of two, you know, of two poles, you know, opposed to each other with one, you know, with one conservative party, religious, you know, monarchical, and one constitutional party. You've never had that in France. You've had a cons consistently a shifting nimbus of parties on each side. And even when the, you know, the, the, the sort of fundamental issues that, that this particular split was about, including religion, including anti-Semitism, um, you know, really ceased to operate after, 19, after 1944, at least to the extent that it had before. You didn't have anything like um, a move towards stable political parties of the sort that you find in the United States. So I would contest that. I think that, I think that that is certainly one factor, and certainly when it comes to acknowledging the legitimacy, um, that, 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 that it is a very large factor, um, throughout particularly throughout the 19th century. And yet, I think that another factor which is very important is the huge degree of symbolic legitimacy possessed by the, rep the, the figure of the republic itself, which is, which is my argument, which allows, which makes it there therefore very difficult for these parties to establish any kind of, of sort of comparable legitimacy as national institutions. And that what one sees again and again in French politics is that while in practice, of course, the parties do accept each other's legitimacy today, it's remarkable the extent to which the socialists and, you know, th and the, and the, and the Gaullists particularly will accuse each other of seizing the state, of corrupting the state. Maybe that's similar to what we see now in the United States. We may be seeing a weakening of the party system here today. Um, but um, the extent to which is they were always, you know, people are always talking about l'État RPR, the UPR, the, you know, the RPR state, the Gaullist state, how the UMP state, how the socialists were accused of completely corrupting and taking over the institutions of the state and using it for party purposes suggests that even today the acceptance of the legitimacy is still limited to a certain, to, to again, compared to the United States, I would say. Um, so so that, that would be my argument. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, coming to more modern times, I've just got a query about uh, whether you've got any observations on republic, state, and then the whole French drive to really get the EU mm -hmm. going, because that seems sort of counter to the focus on on, on, on on the republic as a sort of unifying concept I'm not sure I'm not sure that it is I mean I think that the um, even under the first French Republic I mean the the, the, the um, French Republican leaders have always been remarkably open to confederations of states um, I think it has been I think you know quite frankly it's been often taken for granted that France is willing to accept this role in the EU because France can dominate it. Um, and that therefore, while there may be some sort of overlap of authority, overlap of, of even of constitutions, that fundamentally this is not going to, there's never really been the sense in, in France that, 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 that French sovereignty could be threatened in the way that one often hears in Britain, for instance, that, that British sovereignty would be threatened by the imposition of EU legislation and so on and so forth. That the there's either the sense that you know it wouldn't affect it, or that uh, it would be more or less commensurate with what you already have in, in France itself, or that the French would be able to essentially determine what that legislation is to a very large extent. Um, so, but I think for the most part, you know, for, uh, the French, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's been surprising a little, little of an issue for the French elites. It's been, of course, a very large issue for the French voting public as a whole, as one saw during the referendum. Um, on the proposed constitution, which was rejected, of course, by the French by the French voting public. So there, one did see this. Although, I think there again, it tended to be rejected much more on on economic grounds, on the 
fears of, of, of uncontrolled immigration from the other EU states, particularly in Eastern Europe. Um, but um, but that's uh, that was how I would. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, when we speak about uh, difference between uh, experience of the democracy and republic in the United States and the French, we don't speak about the fact that uh, on the French we have a very big influence of the communism and socialism ideas, especially from the 19th century. What do you speak about the influence on practice and uh, experience of the French democracy of these ideas? Thank you. Well, I think one of the interesting things about 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 this is that um, is the extent to which Marxist parties in France always did pledge a degree of, of loyalty to the Republic, in which the Republic could always be a symbol, going back to the First Republic, the Jacobin Republic, of radical aspirations. Uh, these these uh, these parties, um, certainly the Communist Party, always maintained the equation 1789 arrow 1917, the French Revolution as being the the first, admittedly imperfect, and yet still necessary prelude to the Russian Revolution. Um, and as I think many historians have shown, the, the, the socialists and the communists in France were both able to you know, sort of fully integrate the story of the First Republic and the French Revolution into the stories as they told them about themselves to integrate a kind of Jacobin perspective, um, and therefore to, um, you know, <coughs> and I think in, in many ways the, the idea of this <coughs> they, they, they would often interestingly reject what they would call bourgeois democracy while still defending the French Republic um, as being something which they could still put to their, put to their use. So I, so I wouldn't see, I would see this as, 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 as part of the story that I didn't have a chance to, to get into here, but one that, 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 that actually fits in fairly well. Yeah. Neil, Catherine. I wanted to uh, ask you about the relationship between um, democracy and, um, and the Republic that you cast as problematic in the French case. And in particular, um, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to ask you about this notion of the crowd, which in many ways is, is the way the people is embodied in France. Because the French Republic has a, has a sort of uh, difficult relationship with the crowd, to put it mildly, in that the crowd as the people has been a problem as opposed to a support of the Republic, sort of historically speaking. So I'm wondering if the concept of Republic, if you see the concept of Republic as being somehow at odds with the crowd or having some kind of difficult relationship with the crowd, and if that somehow relates to this question of the problem of democracy. Oh, very much so. That's the, I mean, that's the, and in fact, that, that was exactly what I was trying to develop. Um, one thing which the Republic you know, generally stands for in, in France is a certain notion of order, of fixity. And I think coming back to Emmett's question that while um, certainly the meaning of Republic has been quite varied, and can could be consonant with certainly what you know certainly with Baudin it could be consonant with with with, with a monarchical ideal. Nonetheless, there in you know in classical republican thought, of course, the 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 republic does stand for you know a for, you know form of government that as much as possible defies the passage of time, that defies disorder, um, and that can and is always wrestling against disorder and corruption. And one of these forms of disorder and corruption is precisely the the unruly crowd, um, and. Therefore, and therefore, this is. If I'm sorry. I would probably want to defer here to the um, to the to the American hist historians, but I would say that in that in the that in the United States, there have been. I mean, I would, uh, and you know, this comes from you know broad ignorance of large stretches of American history, but I would certainly say that uh, in the United States, there have been more ways for the crowd to organize itself in in, in ways that are perceived as politically legitimate. Even you know whether whether through the political parties, through movements like the populist movements of the of the 1890s, um, and to take sort of organized political form, whereas in France it has often been perceived precisely as a kind of extra political, and therefore in one sense non-legitimate form. Whether it be of the sans culottes who precisely refused to organize themselves into any kind of political party or political faction, who who you know went so far as at one point to surround the National Convention with cannon in 1793. Um, and moving on, you know, and, and expressing itself throughout much of the 19th and even 20th century in the sort of, you know, characteristically French forms of, of political protest that involve crowd, you know, crowd movements, strike movements, um, very much, you know, seen as being outside of the purview of the, of the political parties and of any kind of sort of organ organization. And that, um, 
except for the trade unions. I mean, the trade yes. unions in France are extremely powerful even today. I mean, they can shut the country down in ways that American trade unions can't. Yes, but they're not parties, and they're not. No, that's true. But they are, you know, they are. Yes, and this is the yeah. this is the form that they take. But yes. Yeah, but then, then you ha and 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 yes, and they, and they're always trying to control these crowd movements, and you see even the student unions are trying yeah. to control the movements of students, and yet it is seen as something fundamentally of a different order from the, the political process itself, um, I would say. So, but yes, I would agree with absolutely with what you're saying. Um, I'm, I'm still sort of mulling over your point about um, person, the cult of personality and it's mm -hmm. being so discouraged in France and, 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 not, and, and encouraged here. Um, and I wonder if it has something to do with the fact that, um, I mean, obviously both revolutions were against monarchies, but, mm -hmm. but it was a much more immediate uh, revolution, a much more immediate revolt against the monarch in, in mm -hmm. France, and you know it was quite visceral, uh, in fact. Um, and so it's you know, would you could you say that, or could you argue that um, the rejection of public personality is really a way of sort of keeping the the idea of the resurgence of a monarch at bay? Whereas in the United States, the absence of a monarch is something that we're, it's a void we're always trying to fill <laughs> in some way with by mm -hmm. you know sort of cultivating our our leaders, or is that too no, that's that, 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 that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think what's what I would disagree a little bit, just because in, if you look at the at the at the beginnings of both of both revolutions in the United States, it's very viscerally and immediately um, anti-monarchical. I mean, if you read the Declaration of Independence, most of it is a bill of indictment against George III. For the first two or three years of the French Revolution, who was the most popular political figure in France? Louis the Sixteenth, by a long shot. And yet, of course, this is followed by enormous, you know, uh, deception. And uh, no, no much disappointment uh, with after the flight to Varennes and such, and um, <coughs> and well I said we weren't, we weren't in danger <laughs> of having <laughs> the, I mean we were in danger mm -hmm. of having the, the the British monarchy come back in the form of the army, but not you know sort of the physical presence of the king was sort of kept it sort of an ocean it kept it, the people in the ocean. But I think I th no I think there's a lot to what you say, and I think that uh, also in the in the American political context, I mean it remained. You know, the colonies remained in many ways, you know, still, you know, fundamentally British in their political culture through the revolution. And there was the, and particularly with a figure like Washington there, the assumption was that they could be able to have someone, you know, so, so someone, some, someone like, like a monarch. Mm -hmm. um, but what I find fascinating is the way in which, the, you know, the, sort of the democratic movements are able to seize upon all these various, you know, <coughs> you know, figures like Jackson, particularly and to make these sort of popular heroes of them and make them the symbols of these political parties in a way that in France was still considered illegitimate. Um, and again, partly, you know, because in France they, they had the experience of someone like Bonaparte, of course, because he was the great figure of the 1790s who did, who did you know, tell these uh, stories about his life and, you know, was a kind of public figure in a way that none of the revolutionaries were ever successful at doing before him when they'd look at how they did. Um. And, the, and the other question I have is, um, you s I mean, you seem to be sort of valorizing the American political parties mm -hmm. or suggesting that the lack of stable political parties in France is, is not a good thing. But is that really the case? I mean, isn't it, is it, I mean, our parties, I think, are, you know, sometimes they're kind of moribund in a way. Mm -hmm. and it's very difficult. I mean, they're so large and they're so bureaucratic and it's so hard for people to break into them. I mean, there's a, there's a feminist critique of them. Mm -hmm. There's a, you know, critique of minorities. I mean, all that sort of thing, whereas it mm -hmm. seems that a, that a system where parties can sort of form and dissolve rather easily is much more flexible, much more responsive to popular will in some mm -hmm. ways. So, um, I'm not sure I, w I, I really meant to say that it was a good thing. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean you I'm were very, you were being subtle, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of caricaturing it, but I mean, anyway, whatever. But um, I think, though, that what happens, you know, in 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 France with with I mean, the great disadvantage of these parties in France is that. In, in the end, they don't have, you know, anything like the, the structures that allow sort of new new forces or new people to come in, with the result that they tend to again and again to be co-opted by the same elites that are trained to come back to Michel Garin's question, that are really sort of creatures of the state bureaucracy, that are people like like Chirac, like the graduates of the Ecole Nationale d'Administration, who, who were able to sort of move into these parties very seamlessly and control them. Um, so I'm not sure it's, it's good either side, <laughs> 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 um, I wouldn't put in any brief for the American political parties, but uh, but again, I mean, you know, uh, you know, can't see anybody like Obama coming up to it in France. And not not in the Fifth Republic, certainly, mm -hmm. not in the Fourth either, or the Third. I'd, I'd like to go back to the the crowd for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, 
what changes, what do you see as having changed um, when the crown is not French? Um, the impact of immigration mm -hmm. on, on the, this tension between democracy and the republic? <sighs> That's a big question. Um, and um, <coughs> I think you know, we have to go back to look at the relationship between the republic and immigration in general. Um, you know, France, of course, has been a country of immigrants since the late 19th century. Between the wars, it had, you know, it accepted a larger proportion of immigrants, much larger than the United States did. Um, and the Republic was always seen as the great integrative force uh, that was able to take young Italians, Poles, Greeks, Jews, Spaniards, whatever, and make them seamlessly into French people to the extent that you wouldn't have even the kind of hyphenated identities that you would have in the United States. Um, and I think what's what is so the phenomenon of the crowd that is not French is really one of very recent history, and is really focused on the Muslim crowd, um, and particularly you know on the 2000 2005 riot, right. um, <coughs> and is bound up very much in France with the very conscious attempt today across the political spectrum to 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 rehabilitate the notion of republic. Um, because one of the things which again which I didn't well, didn't have a chance to get into as much, but I mean. <coughs> the, I mean the the success of the rep of the republic as a symbol like this has certainly has certainly waned, waxed and waned over time. I think for much of the Fifth Republic, in part because of the you know the various ideological struggles there, and be because of De Gaulle himself managing to impose a kind of you know sort of quasi monarchical system, there was this you know there was there was a tendency for some time to write off the early rep early republics. As, as, as failures to a greater degree. The First Republic, for the obvious reason, the Third Republic, because it fell victim to the ideological tensions of the 1930s. And therefore, um, to say that only, only with the kind of blending of monarchy and republic in the Fifth Republic have, have the French sort of finally succeeded in having a stable politics, which I think we're a little premature in that. Um, but what has been fascinating is that, particularly over the past 15, 20 years, um, there has been a sense that, in fact, what you need to do is precisely to strengthen republican institutions above all the school system, which is, which had been greatly weakened by 1968. That you need to strengthen the strengthen the role again the role of the republic in integrating people. I mean, the republic always, and this is an argument of, of one of my books, that the republic, w you know, at its founding, had the great mission, of course, of integrating the, the French rural masses into into the republic. That during the period of the empire, it also set itself the mission to a certain extent and in very complicated ways of integrating colonial populations into the empire. And from the Third Republic onwards, although it had, it had the mission of integrating immigrants, um, <coughs> and that in, in a sense, you know, when, when the first two of these missions ceased, when the rural masses evaporated and the, um, and the empire evaporated, you know, this, this, this kind of republican mission sort of fell a bit into abeyance. But in the past 15, 20 years, faced with the changing demographics, there have been increasing calls to to again strengthen, to rebuild Republican institutions that are seen as being unduly weak, precisely in order to integrate these, these people who would otherwise precisely turn into this kind of unruly, dangerously destructive crowd, or even worse, in the, you know, in the French imagination today, in some French imaginations, you know, would, would threaten to turn France Islamic. I mean, so. Perhaps slightly, um, uh, outrageous in this context, but um, thinking about the, the political takeaway of this session, if I worked for, you know, like David for State Department and came back, and what, what do you spend the last 90 minutes learning about the French and American revolutions and democracy and uh, republicanism? And um, we're here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and Wilson famously wanted to make the world safe for democracy. And I sort of wonder if, if you know, one takeaway from uh, your lecture is that, you know, we need to sort of adjust our vocabulary. Um, if you and I here, I'd like to push you in the same way that Sonia tried to push you a little bit. You know, you seem to sort of take the American model uh, in slightly in a more positive way. Is you know, should we be, um, uh, you know, if we have to run around the world and democratize, uh, should we be uh, republicizing um, the world? Is this really? Well, we look at the mess that you know uh, um, uh, we're in in the Middle East and. Afghanistan, Iraq, political parties. You look at, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the parties in, in Gaza and in Palestine. So, is is uh, is that a um, is that one of the takeaways from your um, to 
really push you uh, push the envelope on your on your thesis there. But you know, we are here at the risk with the risk assignment. So. Okay. Um, if there were a takeaway from it, I would say that what the takeaway is is that you know, the obviously sort of a very obvious one, but one which is not always recognized in the city, which is that democracy has, you know, you when you use democracy simply as a slogan, you lose sight of complexities that, you know, and that losing sight of those complexities gets you into real trouble on the ground real fast. Because what is democracy? I mean, there's no, there's no simple definition of it, obviously, and yet, you know, talking about making the world safer democracy, you seem to think, you know, it automatically leads to the assumption that there is such a thing out there and you can, and, and that it, it can be introduced into many different contexts in essentially the same way. And obviously democracy is many different things and what, what I think is bracing about reading all the condemnations of quote democracy written by our own founding fathers is precisely that they often saw quote democracy close quote as being something very dangerous. And they therefore designed a political system in large part to check what they saw as the abuses and dangers of quote democracy. And that, and that you have to, the, you can think of, dem of, of the abstraction of, of, of popular rule as being a value, but that gets you nowhere in terms of how to implement it. So that's, that would be the takeaway. That you need, that, you know, that's only, that's, that's, that's the start of a conversation to say that you want democracy, that you support democracy. But it's, on, but it's only the very start and it's not the end. You can't say, all right, you've decided you want democracy, end of conversation. You need to decide what you mean by it and then how you're going to implement it. I try, I try to think a little <laughs> bit about, <laughs> yeah, about um, the U US, I mean, even in its in, at early stages, it's still being a federation. Mm -hmm. And so maybe people felt like they had more, you know, there it was more direct rule within the, the colonies and then the mm -hmm. states then, you know, and then, you know, and then as it got bigger, then the, the potential for direct democracy obviously became attenuated. But, but France, well, how, I mean, I don't know, I don't know Fran French history that well. I mean, how strong were the département, uh, you know, at the time of the revolution? Um, was it, did, did it already, cons did French people, they already thought of themselves as a nation, mm -hmm. not as a, not as a f collection of département or having, you know, where regions, or the, but the well regions certainly were. there was a single national yeah. government and that was not thought, I mean, Regionalism is a, it's a very complex question, but certainly in comparison to the United States, we had a single national state, a single, mm -hmm. um, generally a single sense of being a, a, a nation despite all the complexities that go into it, which I guess I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, you know, of course, what, what, what you have in the United States, which is interesting, is you've had this, this you know, precisely the ability. And we, we forget about one, one of the most astonishing things about the American Revolution, um, which got a huge amount of attention in France in the 1780s, which is the which was the way that the different colonies themselves formed different laboratories for different sorts of democracy in the American Revolution. I mean, in some ways, one of the most radical constitutions ever to exist in the West was the 1776 Constitution of the State of Pennsylvania, uh, which was, was, you know, was one of the one of the earliest, you know, constitutions with universal suffrage, with, you know, um, great role for sort of, you know, popular veto and things like that. Um, other states had considerably more hierarchical systems in initially. Um, and, you know, one of the most popular publications in, in France and indeed across Europe in the 1780s were the constitutions of the various American colonies and then states. Um, because, and they were often very different from each other and they were debated, well, was, was North Carolina better than Virginia? Mm -hmm. What about Pennsylvania, Rhode Island? I mean, these differences were seen as very, very significant until, you know, and it, you know until the, the uh, the national constitution came in 1789, and even then, e even then, until the sort of the supremacy of national law over state law was finally accepted by the states, which is still not entirely. <laughs> I mean, and even even today in Europe, I mean, it's always remarkable when you tell them about the varieties of state law. You tell them that Nebraska has a unicameral legislature, and say, how can that be? You know, those, you know, and things like that, um, and still makes a bigger, bigger impression, I think, in Europe than it does here, where we take it for granted. similar to an earlier question, but I wonder if you could, rather than do, whether you could direct your comparison at the uh, French democracy and other European democracies, and whether you see the, the kinds of 
not flaws necessarily, but the characteristics of French Republican democracies as being distinct in important ways from other European democracies. Hmm. Um, I think that would get that gets very very complicated very quickly. I think that uh, although I think um, in large parts of Europe, of course, it all gets bound up with the influence of the French Revolution. Um, so that where you've had Republican constitutions, such as in Italy since, since the war or shortly after the war, um, in Portugal since the revolution there in 75, um, you've often you had a deliberate attempt to sort of copy, you know, not just the, the name of republic, but sort of some of the rituals of the, of the, of the French Republic. Um, you, you know, and I, th I think But I think what in France, it, the, the unique history of the French Republic coming out of you know, the, the huge struggles that, have, that, there, that there were to, to, to establish it and then reestablish it and reestablish it again and again and again um, did create a kind of greater prestige and within the, the political culture and focus on the, simply on the name and the and institutions of the Republic than in most of these other, than in most of these other states, uh, most of the other Republican states in Europe. And it's still remarkable the extent to which you know the number of European states that 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 that, that retained monarchy in the end, even you know, in, in part precisely because to, to to have some sort of focus of national political life that that was that was stable and could serve these symbolic purposes very well. So not just Britain, but Belgium, Spain, Scandinavian countries, you know, the Netherlands. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. the monarch that you have in. in Scandinavia, for example, and Great Britain yep. is filled by this Marianne figure yes, who's, absolutely. Who's, who's abstract, and that fits very well with the French <laughs> desire to abstract anything, right? So <laughs> rather than put it in a real person, we'll put it in <laughs> That's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we open that can of worms over a, a bottle of wine? Uh, why doesn't everybody join us outside to have further conversation with our speaker and to thank him? And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>